So as we come to diastole and we have the mitral valve just opening, um, we can see that we have this big gradient between our left atrial pressure and our left ventricular pressure. And so we get rapid filling. All right, so this early diastolic period and this rapid filling here is our E-wave. And then in, uh, we have this period of diastasis in, in diastole where our pressures are pretty, um, pretty much equalized in, in health. And so we get uh, cessation of filling. And then we get a rapid filling when the normal, healthy, compliant atria contracts and um, that residual blood that's still in the atrium sort of contracts through from the left atrium into the left ventricle. <laughs> so normal sort of values are an E to, so this is our E wave, and this is our A wave, a normal E to A ratio would be between 0.8 and 2. Um, and something that's really useful, particularly when not all of your parameters are available, and we had an example of this the other day, Ben, didn't we? We were talking about deceleration time, um, the normal, which is the, the decel time of this, of your E-wave, essentially, um, which is normally between, in health, between 160 and 200 milliseconds, approximately. Okay, so that's that's sort of when, you know, when it happens and what a normal would look like. So this is how it looks with echo, of course. So we have our pulse wave Doppler and we put that at the tips of the mitral leaflet. And this, the, you know, we need to make sure our settings and scale and everything is set accordingly. So we're still in meters per second here, as you'll see. And you can see that um, the sonographer has turned down the gain beautifully, the baselines to the bottom. We haven't got that awful sort of feathering. We've got lovely modal velocity and we're measuring at the peak of the bright line, essentially peak of the modal velocity for our E-wave, which is here. And you can see that that comes to 0.75 meters per second. And this is our A-wave, which is 0.93 meters per second. And the ratio of those two things gives us an E to A ratio of 0.8, which would be in the normal range. And then as we come down to, this is tissue Doppler imaging, which I realize this is a revision for, for probably all of you on, on this um, online here, but just to show that in, in tissue Doppler, obviously we're, we're measuring myocardial velocities, which are much lower than tissue blood velocity than blood velocity and so now we're in centimeters per second and we can see that we've got this is a septal mitral annulus and we can measure the lateral mitral annulus in this septal value of more than seven centimeters per second we're here in 0 0.08 0, uh, 0 0.08 meters per second um, so that's normal that's above seven centimeters per second so if we see patterns like this that would be in keeping with you know relatively normal diastology um, obviously combining it with, with everything else. Now, as we move towards impaired relaxation, you can see that what's happening here is it's taking long, if we look at just the pressure waveform, it's now taking longer for our LV to relax. And so we get this smaller gradient between our LA and LV. Okay, so the way that this manifests in terms of what we're detecting with pulse wave Doppler is that we get, we get a, we usually get a smaller E wave, but the D cell time really blows out because we've got this left ventricle that's got impaired relaxation. Okay, it's not really stiff like it is in advanced diastolic dysfunction, but we've got this sort of impaired relaxation. So we get a reduction in that pressure gradient, so a smaller E wave, and then we get you know, prolonged deceleration time. And because our atria is still fine and we've got more residuum in the atrium at the end of rapid filling, so at the end of early diastole and in the mid part we've got a bigger residuum which is why you get an increase in your airwave in in impaired relaxation and grade one diastolic dysfunction so this is the sort of physiological explanation for why we see this e to a ratio go down to less than 0.8 and we usually find that the d cell time in these kind of patients increases beyond normal so beyond a ballpark of about 200 milliseconds these are not hard and fast numbers they're just um, ballparks so this is this is what it would look like with our pulse wave Doppler here at the top, our EA of a, you know, around 0.8. And we can see that we've still got, because we've got um, impaired relaxation, but we haven't got that awful sort of stiff ventricle, we still get relatively, not completely normal, but relatively um, normal E prime values. And generally, because we, at this stage, we haven't got raised left atrial pressure, our E to E prime values tend to be, you know, um, less than eight, or sometimes between that sort of gray zone of eight and, 14. As we then move to, and this is this is a classic example of what we see with impaired relaxation, so that shorter E-velocity, 
you know, a slightly longer D cell time, not quite 200, but getting there. Um, and our A wave is bigger than our E wave. And what we see with our E prime values, so that myocardial velocity, is they're often maybe a little bit reduced, but not but not um not very, very low, like you find in the more restrictive um phenotypes. So as we then move to sort of stage two, which or grade two diastolic dysfunction, which is sometimes referred to as pseudonormal, I tend not to use that too much. Essentially, what we want to know in the ICU population is, you know, are we dealing with raised left atrial pressures? Because that's really going to affect what we do. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about, about how it affects our practice as we look through some cases. So moving from this sort of impaired relaxation or stage one to, to sort of grade two diastolic dysfunction, what starts to happen now is we have this stiff left ventricle. So we've got reduced compliance in our left ventricle. And therefore, the gradient, as we can see here, between our left ventricle and left atrium increases further. So we get a taller, a taller E wave. And because we haven't developed atrial systolic failure just yet, then we're still able to get a reasonable A wave contraction, giving us a, a reasonable sized A wave. So what happens is the ratio then sort of normalizes. But things that we can look at to differentiate between normal and, and pseudo normal would be a few things. Um, one thing that you can look at, because your ratio is going to be the same between 0.8 and, and less than 2 for your EA. Another thing that sometimes gives it away is the D cell time. We tend to have shorter D cell times in, in grade 2 diastolic dysfunction. But a key thing, and of course, we can do the Valsalva maneuver. So does anyone want to tell me what would happen if you if this patient with grade 2 diastolic dysfunction did a Valsalva maneuver? What would happen to the what would happen to the E and the A? Reversal of the wave by a fifty percent. Beautiful, yeah, exactly. So you get reduction in your E wave, but increase in your A wave, um, but to more by more than uh, fifty or so percent. What would what would happen in you or I, presuming we hopefully fingers crossed have have normal diastology? What would happen to to what what would happen to our E and A waves? What's a normal response? They they both go down. So both, both go down together as opposed to that discrepancy. So you, you're really sort of bringing out that abnormality by getting getting them to Valsalva, um, you know, sort of increasing intrathoracic pressure, reducing venous return. So you could get them to Valsalva and look for that reversal in E to A. Um, but the easier thing to do is actually just to look at your E to E prime, e to e prime values. So often the thing that I'll just look at, I'll look at the D cell time, see whether it's short, and then I'll look at the E prime value. And if that's low, if that's, you know, less than seven centimeters per second on the medial or less than 10 in the lateral centimeters per second, then I know that that's got to be, you know, pseudo normal rather than normal diastology. Um, but the reason why we can't use E, to, and I don't think this is really understood that well um, sometimes, is that the reason that we can't just rely on our E to A value um, is because, you know, patient, normal athletes that are fit and well can have E to A ratios of three, four, can't they? And we need to be able to differentiate those that are sick with diastolic dysfunction and those that are just, you know, fit and well. And the reason for that is obviously your E wave is, is load dependent and it's actually proportional to your left atrial pressure. That makes sense. But it's also inversely proportional to something called tau. Now, tau, it sounds complicated, but it's not. It's essentially just the rate of um, the rate of um, pressure decay in isovolumetric relaxation. So the longer your tau, um, the longer your LV is taking to relax, essentially. And so if you have a really fit athlete with a really short tau, Right, so they're relaxing. They've got a really good ventricle. It's relaxing really, really quickly. That means they're going to have a really short um, tau variable, and so they're going to have a high E wave. Right, so that's need to combine E with our E prime value because um, it's inversely proportional to tau as well. So if you combine, so therefore, if you put the ratio of LAP over that, then you can work out whether your pathology is because of raised left atrial pressure or inversely, because you've just got someone that has um, got a high E-wave because they've got a really good ventricle that's relaxing. So that's why it's important to, to look at your E-value, your E-wave as well as your E-prime. And then as we move on to um, restrictive disease, we, we get our EA ratio becoming 
even higher, right? So more than two in those that, and we'll go over the guidelines at the end, but in those that have an impaired left ventricle, left ventricular systolic function, so ejection fraction in the guidelines of less than 50% or evidence of structural heart disease with left, eject, left ventricular ejection fraction of, of greater than or equal to 50%, then we need to use, um, you know, we can use that guideline with the EA of more than two would automatically put patients into grade three diastolic dysfunction. And importantly for us, that means they've got raised left atrial pressures. So generally, again, we can look at the D-cell time. And classically, these patients will have really sharp, sort of so really high, um, you know, velocities of, of way above sort of uh, 50 centimetres per second. And they'll have really short D-cell times, usually less than 160. Um, and we can see that, that that's because that gradient between the um, left atrial and left ventricular pressure is even higher now because they've got raised left atrial pressure. And these patients then tend to develop atrial systolic failure essentially so their airwaves are not as big so that's why they get that big separation and that e to a that's more than two um, so i'm sure you've seen these kind of patients before um, and their e primes are often very very low because they've got really stiff non-compliant ventricles um, you often see this delay as well between your e wave and your e prime and generally speaking not always but generally speaking they have e to e prime values of some more than 14 and this is how it would look so we have this classic restrictive pattern. We've got our really tall E waves, so looking E velocity of sort of nine, 90 centimeters per second. Um, and then we have our D cell time, which is really short, 91 milliseconds, and giving us an E to A ratio of 2.4. Okay. And obviously, we're of course going to put this with the clinical context. Um, and then we look at our E prime, and we can see our septal E prime is terribly low of four centimeters per second, and lateral E prime of barely anything. Um, and this would be, you know, absolutely classic for um, restrictive or grade three diastolic dysfunction and raised left atrial pressures. So I'm going to quiz you now, now that I've just gone over that basic physiology. I'd like you to tell me if there's anyone that wants to volunteer what we are looking at. And I'm going to point, I just, I'd like you to say what this time period is here between the white tram lines. Any volunteers? Interventricular contraction time. Very nice, Ben. Yeah. Obviously. Oh, <laughs> okay. What about this one here? So that's our S wave. And then we've got E and A, like one, two, three. That's here. So systolic. And then uh, yeah, early and uh, early diastolic and then actual contraction. Very nice. Do you all get that? So we've got um this I'm gonna start from here. So we've got this early spike here, which is isovolumetric contraction. Sometimes people can get confused and sort of measure the um S wave there. So it's really important to recognize that's the isovolumetric contraction spike. And then we have the S wave. And I think normal values on the left side are about eight centimeters per second, greater than eight centimeters per second, something like that. Um, and then we have a time in between here, which you can't really see, which I think I've got up there. We go um, this, um, you know, I'm measuring from where the black part ends. So this part here mm. to where the black part of this one starts again. Yeah, so from there to there. That's our isovolumetric relaxation time. And that can be quite useful some, sometimes. I can't say I use it that often, but you, but it does. I'll show you some examples of when it might be helpful. Um, and then we have our E wave and our A wave, and then we have um, isovolumetric contraction time. So they look, for any of you that are doing the American exams, they sort of love all of this, um, you know, quiz, quizzing you on, on different aspects of this, but it's also obviously crucial for your clinical, or well, echo and clinical practice as well. Um, so where to measure it then? It's you want to make sure that you haven't got too much feathering, so you turn your gain down, and then for your e for your e wave, which is really the only one that we measure mostly, um, you want to measure on the outer aspect of this bright tracing. Okay, that's what's recommended um, in the guidelines. So we call that the peak modal velocity at the leading edge of the spectral waveform. So this red part here is would be where you would measure. If you learnt something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching.